Dear ladies and gentlemen, greetings from the Malaysian Obstetric Medicine Society. And I'm pleased to meet you all in another important lecture titled Proteinuria in Pregnancy. I believe it is important to understand what are some common causes and to highlight that not all proteinuria in pregnancy is related to infection, not all proteinuria in pregnancy is related to preeclampsia, but it's important to have a systematic approach. So, ladies and gentlemen, in this talk, I'm going to highlight why did I choose this topic in the first instance. The four unspoken rules of proteinuria that I believe everyone should appreciate. I'm going to share some real life clinical vignettes so that we can spot the diagnosis. What is considered normal? Some causes of proteinuria, appreciating various types of proteinuria. And finally, how to differentiate between nephritic and nephrotic syndrome and how to approach. And finally, to summarize my approach towards proteinuria at term and proteinuria remote from term, which I believe needs a holistic systematic approach. So, ladies and gentlemen, why this lecture? I believe I would like to highlight one fact, that the obstetric fraternity and almost all of us our over-reliance on urine albumin has a screening tool for renal diseases. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are so many ways to screen for renal diseases. It could be a simple urine albumin. It could be a spot urine protein creatinine ratio. It could be a blood test. But we, even in the modern world of obstetrics, are still screening for renal, renal diseases merely by doing a urine albumin, a test which is purely insensitive. It is cheap, but it is insensitive, and that is why I'm going to highlight in this talk. Why this lecture, ladies and gentlemen? I think often all of us assume that every proteinuria is either due to infection or preeclampsia, a fact that we must understand it may not be the one and only cause. And finally, there seems to be a little bit delay in diagnosis, delay in referrals, because we assume that the proteinuria is not significant, or we assume that the proteinuria is not because of an underlying cause. And all of this I intend to highlight in the next 30 minutes. What are the four unspoken rules about proteinuria? Ladies and gentlemen, rule number one, urine dipstick alone that we often perform for all pregnant mothers has the lowest sensitivity to diagnose proteinuria. It is cheap. It is a point of care testing. It is readily available, but it's highly insensitive to detect proteinuria. Rule number two, not all proteinuria in pregnancy equates to preeclampsia. New onset proteinuria at term possibly can be preeclampsia, but not all proteinuria means preeclampsia. Fact number three, serum albumin is a far more important clinical measurement rather than urine albumin. Now, what is important in the clinical practice is not how much of protein you lose, but how much of protein you have in your system, which is even far more important. So if you have any patient who loses protein, apart from a kidney test, do a liver function test to take a look at a serum albumin. But finally, ladies and gentlemen, Think of preeclampsia. If it's a new onset proteinuria in the late part of the pregnancy, either in the late second or third trimester, but look for other causes. If it's proteinuria early in the pregnancy or remote from term. And these are the four unspoken rules in proteinuria. Now, having said that, let's look at four different clinical vignettes, ladies and gentlemen. Clinical vignette number one. A 42-year-old primary gravida books a pregnancy at 22 weeks. Her blood pressure is elevated, 140-90. Her urine albumin is 1+. plus. What is the diagnosis, ladies and gentlemen? I think in the first instance, every one of us will think that this is perhaps preeclampsia. But let's be holistic, ladies and gentlemen. She's 42 years old. This is unclassified hypertension. Is this really preeclampsia or does she have an undiagnosed underlying renal disease or is it actually chronic hypertension 
with an underlying macro fatigue. So ladies and gentlemen, having an albumin of one plus does not mean that it is preeclampsia. It's important to be holistic. Having said that, the highest chance of detecting proteinuria via urine albumin is usually after 20 weeks. That is because that is when the physiological changes and the amount of protein loss is high. So having an albumin, urine albumin at 22 weeks and above, does not mean she never had proteinuria before that. Hence, it's good to quantify, it's good to appreciate that it is insensitive, it's good to be holistic. Clinical vignette number two, a 38-year-old mother with type 2 diabetes with underlying retinopathy presents at 26 weeks. Her urine albumin is 3+. plus. Her blood pressure is 140-90. What is the diagnosis, ladies and gentlemen? Of course, almost everyone in the crowd would think that this is preeclampsia. But how do you know that this is preeclampsia? Or how do we know it is actually not diabetes with an underlying nephropathy? Although nephropathy may worsen, although proteinuria may worsen, the management differs, ladies and gentlemen. Preeclampsia means we need to consider delivery. If it's worsening nephropathy, perhaps there is a role for prolongation of pregnancy. Hence, ladies and gentlemen, for all high-risk patients, especially diabetic, don't just send a urine albumin at booking. Send a urine PCR to exclude an underlying renal cause to exclude nephropathy so that we can confidently differentiate between a worsening nephropathy and a new disease called preeclampsia. Clinical renate number three. A 24-year-old primary gravida presents with headache at 19 weeks. Her platelets were 82. Her urine albumin is 2+. plus. What is the diagnosis, ladies and gentlemen? Now, this is not preeclampsia because she's 19 weeks, although it may happen, it's important to consider other differential diagnosis. This is not health syndrome because you will have to prove hemolysis secondary to maha, but it's important to look at other causes. Now, the diagnosis in this patient is actually a flare of SLE with lupus nephritis. So ladies and gentlemen, this patient not just needs a renal function, but this patient needs a renal function, an ANA, a complementary markers of C3, C4, and a double standard DNA, and even perhaps a renal biopsy. So what I'm trying to highlight, it may manifest with proteinuria for the first time, but it's important to be holistic. There's not one cause, but there are various causes of proteinuria in pregnancy. The final clinical we need, the easiest among the four, a 27-year-old teacher is known to have nephrolithiasis. She books at 10 weeks. In order to have urine albumin of 2 plus, what is the diagnosis, ladies and gentlemen? Perhaps it could be because of a nephrolithiasis or it could be because of an obstructive uropathy. This patient needs an early referral. This patient needs an ultrasound KUB. This patient needs a urology review. And this proteinuria perhaps needs to have an intervention. So ladies and gentlemen, to summarize my four clinical needs, I believe it is important to universally screen every pregnant mother for renal diseases, but we should understand that urine albumin alone has a screening tool. It is cheap, it is a point of care testing, but it is not sensitive if the load of the proteinuria is low. Now, what is the level of significance? The number to remember is 0 0.3 grams over 24 hours. Different labs use different ratios, but if a proteinuria is physiological, if it's less than 0 0.3 grams over 24 hours, anything beyond that needs a holistic evaluation. Now, the traditional aim of proteinuria is to detect preeclampsia, but if you have proteinuria remote from term, you need a holistic approach because, ladies and gentlemen, almost 10 to 15% of women in the reproductive age group may have an undiagnosed renal disease. It's important to look for other causes. 
Now, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease is on the rise. Having said that, diabetes and infection are some common causes of proteinuria. It is also not uncommon to have a woman who is perfectly well to present with proteinuria and have a flare of SLE for the very first time in pregnancy. 13% of patients aged between 20 to 39 may have a mild reduction of GFR based on the Malaysian study, hence think of a renal cause. While the incidence may be as high as 16.8% in the US and perhaps roughly around the same percentage among Asians. And if you pick up proteinuria, there's a risk of progression. They may develop preeclampsia later on. There's a significant impact to the mother and to the fetus. Hence, it's important to get the diagnosis right. Not all proteinuria is preeclampsia. But ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look at some normal values. What is the normal value for urea among pregnant mothers? It's between 3.2 to 4.4. Almost all pregnant mothers should have a creatinine of below 90. Anything above 90 is generally accepted as abnormal in pregnancy. The sodium drops, anything between 130 to 140 is, nine, is normal. And a sodium level of below 130 needs a holistic approach. Because of the renal excretion of your bicarbs, your bicarbonate goes down. A serum albumin drops, but you may accept a normal value of up to 25. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone managing pregnant ladies should use pregnancy-specific values because pregnant mothers have got lower urea, lower sodium, lower bicarbs, lower albumin, all of which is considered normal, especially in the second and third trimester. Having appreciated that, ladies and gentlemen, there are significant challenges in assessing renal function in pregnant mothers. Uric acid is highly insensitive. I think we should not act or make a clinical decision purely based on a uric acid. But plasma, urea, and creatinine also cure crude indices of renal function. I believe we should stop doing uric acid for pregnant mothers because it increases as the weight increases. It increases among mothers who are hypertensive. It increases among mothers who are obese. It is an insensitive test. Having said that, ladies and gentlemen, creatinine does not increase until almost half of the renal function is lost. So to purely make a clinical decision based on creatinine alone may be a late insensitive test. But a more accurate measure should be a GFR with a creatinine or an inulin clearance, which involves a 24-hour collection. So the take-home message from this slide Creatinine, which is everyone's favorite value of assessing renal function, is actually a late sign. Now, kidney diseases can be divided into five stages. Stage one, estimated prevalence of 1.8%, you may only have persistent microalbuminemia, where a urine albumin may not be sensitive to detect. Stage two, you may have persistent microalbuminemia, even a urine albumin may not be able to detect. By the time a urine albumin is positive, the patient should ideally would have been in stage three or when the load significantly increases in the later half of the pregnancy. Hence, urine albumin is an insensitive marker of kidney disease. It's an insensitive marker of severity of kidney disease because you want to pick them up at stage one and stage two not a stage three, stage four, stage five, where the pregnancy implications are significant. So what are the other indirect measures of GFR? You can use the MDRD classification, but it has not been validated in pregnancy. You can use cystatin C, but it is, however, still inaccurate. You can use everyone's commonly used formula, the cockcroft gold formula, but once again, it is not and yet to be validated in pregnancy. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, although creatinine is a highly insensitive test, you need to lose at least 50% of renal function before it goes up. In pregnancy, we may not have a more, better, simpler, easier test than creatinine, but please watch it closely. If creatinine is increased, it means she has almost lost, almost 
50% of a Reno function. So watch the creatinine closely. What's important to calculate and go based on EGFR. Let's talk about renal function, ladies and gentlemen. The majority of pregnant mothers will ideally have a creatinine of below 76, but this depends on the mother's age, this depends on the mother's BMI, but any creatinine of above 90 is generally considered as impaired, but it's important to take a look at the trends rather than a single value. Hence, do not rely on a serum albumin as a test for screening for renal function, but a screening for renal function should ideally include a blood test called renal function. I believe almost every highly pregnant mother needs a renal function at booking, and we should move away from using serum albumin as a good indicator of the amount of protein loss. We should move away from urine albumin, but instead do a renal function. So do we always need 24 hours urine protein? Although it remains the gold standard, it was the gold standard, ladies and gentlemen. I don't think so. Every single patient with proteinuria needs a 24-hour assessment. A better, more modern technique will be a spot urine proteinine creatinine ratio, which is reasonable to rule out a disease, to differentiate between what is physiological and what is pathological. And in fact, a spot creatinine PCR alone is sufficient to diagnose preeclampsia. We have moved away from 24 hours urine protein unless you suspect an underlying renal disease, or that's an important to differentiate between nephritic and a nephrotic syndrome. Now, one of the challenges of 24 hour collection, which we have often always been happy to do, you may have challenges with incomplete collection. It is extremely cumbersome for the patient and sometimes there may be pooling of urine in the uretric dilatation, and hence that may also be insensitive to collect. So you don't often always need 24 hours. I think we should move away from 24 hours collection, but have a 24 hour urine spot rating in ratio, which is an easier, more sensitive point of care testing. Let's talk about pregnancy and proteinuria, ladies and gentlemen. If you're pregnant with proteinuria, it may worsen the severity of proteinuria. Pregnancy may worsen the renal function. It may worsen the incidence of urinary tract infection. If you're pregnant, there's a possibility that a perfectly well patient or a patient with SLE may also have an SLE fat. How about if you have proteinuria and you embark on a pregnancy? There's a higher incidence of preeclampsia, preterm delivery, fetal growth restriction, thrombosis, especially if the serum albumin drops below 20, hence often do not be engrossed with urine protein, but take a look at the serum protein. If it's below 20, he needs prophylactic thromboprophylaxis. The moment your serum albumin drops below 20, the patient may run into complications. Just going to take a look at the serum sodium level. It's because of the ADH hormone which is produced. The moment the sodium level drops below 130, it changes the threshold of a patient to have a seizure, hence that may predispose a seizure. So ladies and gentlemen, the moment you have any patient with proteinuria, apart from assessing her renal function, do a liver function, check her serum albumin, ensure her protein is above 130. Other complications, apart from increase in weight, Apart from pedal edema, is also acute pulmonary edema. So often always auscultate her lungs. Ensure she does not have an APO. And often do a respiratory rate and an SPO2, either in the labor ward or in the high dependency ward. Now, what does the NICE guideline say about proteinuria? The NICE guideline clearly states that one should use an automated region strip device for deep stick screening for pregnant mother. We often do not use an automated device in where I work. If the dipstick is positive, it could be one plus or more, then the next step should be a protein creatinine ratio to quantify protein. Even at one plus, that needs to be assessed. You should not ignore one plus. Don't wait until two plus, three plus. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment your urine albumin is positive, 
quantify and sure if it's significant or it's not significant. You don't often use the first morning urine void to quantify proteinuria. You don't often routinely need a 24-hour collection, but the threshold is 0 0.3 or the threshold is 30 milligrams per millimole. That's a level of significance. The take-home message, all proteinuria needs to be investigated, even if it's one plus. The moving forward, the point of care testing should be a urine PCR. Now let's take a look at the types of proteinuria. There are three types of proteinuria that can excreted in the kidneys. The albumin, the small molecular weight proteins, and the light chains. But among all these three types, ladies and gentlemen, the urine albumin test cannot detect light chains. It is insensitive to detect the small molecular weight proteins. It can only detect one out of these three types, which is the albumins. And that too, not when the load is low, but only when the load is significant. Hence, do not assume that one plus is normal. You have to quantify. Please realize that a urine albumin is highly insensitive. We may need to look at other more sensitive measures of quantification, especially urine PCR, rather than a urine albumin. Now, what are the different modalities to measure proteinuria? We may use our urine diphtic, which we widely use. Now, rule number one, it only measures albumin, not other types or all types of proteinuria. It is only sensitive if the albumin loss is high, more than 30 milligrams per day, but the specificity is low. If you are losing albumin, but if you are losing albumin less than 30 milligrams, you may not be able to detect the test. Few things may alter the sensitivity of the test. Hydration and diuresis will influence sensitivity. The patient drinks a lot of water, if the patient is diureting, you may not be able to quantify it. You will actually miss tubular and outflow types of proteinuria. Of course, it's not recommended to diagnose preeclampsia. Never diagnose preeclampsia based on an insensitive urine dipstick. What about 24-hour collection? It was, it is the gold standard. However, it is incumbersome. It's subject to collection errors that I've mentioned earlier. It may be less practical now that you actually take 24 hours to diagnose a common condition such as renal diseases or preeclampsia. Some recent studies show that you don't really have to collect for 24 hours. That 12-hour collection is far better than 24 hours. And perhaps this is what we may perhaps be moving forward to. But what is best now, ladies and gentlemen, not a serum albumin, not 24-hour collection, but a point of pair testing. Morning samples are preferred. A urine protein creatinine ratio that will give you a point of care testing that is far better sensitive. It will be able to exclude what is normal and what is not normal. And it is important to also to quantify and to ensure that the patient has got a significant proteinuria. Let me use values of 0 0.3 grams as significant. Anything less than that is physiological, needs no assessment. Now, this is a simple diagram, diagram illustrating how protein is actually absorbed and is filtrated through the kidneys. The first barrier are the glomerular filtrates, which are the podocytes. Then you also have podocyte food processes. It goes through the basement membrane. It goes through the fenestrations. And if it goes through these various mechanisms and filtrations, it goes into the bloodstream. The next important filtration mechanism is the resorption of protein in the proximal tubal lubules via the endocytosis and transcytosis. And these are actually resorbed back in the proximal tubular epithelial cells. If it fails the first process, if it fails to be filtrated and resorbed, then is when you actually have the disease it is best quantified on a urine PCR. Now, what are the renal adaptations in pregnancy, ladies and gentlemen? During pregnancy, there's an increase in renal blood flow. There's an increase in glomerular filtration rate. 
but never assume that it is normal, you have to quantify it. And other changes, there's a drop in serum creatinine, hence anything above 96 is abnormal. There's a drop in osmolarity. There's a drop in sodium, but anything below 130 is not normal. There's an increase in protein excretion, but the level of more than 0 0.3 grams is significant. There's a reduction in tubular function. You may have glycosuria and amino aciduria. That's important to quantify. Now, what is the significance of proteinuria? It may happen because of the renal hemodynamic changes in the clinical practice. The gestation that we often, often, always get a referral is when the patient is about 20, 22, 24 weeks. And because of these changes, the load of albumin loss is significant. That is when the urine albumin picks up 2 plus, 3 plus. You would have missed the 1 plus. You would have missed the proteinuria earlier in the part. And that is when, when most patients are referred. But at 22, 24 weeks, ladies and gentlemen, the amount of intervention that can one possibly do is limited. And it is even more challenging to manage the patient at this gestation as compared to an earlier gestation. Now, this hemodynamic changes causes increase in plasma concentration. It causes increase in glomerular permeability, decrease in resorption, and that is why most of these patients are only detected at 20, 22 weeks. If we use the traditional old-fashioned urine albumin as a marker. So how to prevent an early, a late detection? How to detect this condition earlier? It is best not to rely on a urine albumin, but instead to do a urine PCR, because to detect them later in the pregnancy, one, management in pregnancy becomes a challenge. The maternal and fetal complications are extremely significant. And three, it is extremely difficult to differentiate either. It is a worsening renal disease with proteinuria, or whether this is preeclampsia, which was never there earlier in the pregnancy. Let's take a look at urine analysis, ladies and gentlemen. The next time someone sends a urine analysis, two important things to take a look at. Take a look at RBC. Take a look at the nitrates. If the nitrates are positive, there is a sensitive indicator that the patient actually may have an infection. Do not rely on leukocytes. Nitrates are far more sensitive. Apart from nitrates, the second thing to look at is take a look at the RBCs. Take a look at the epithelial cells, and this may give you a cause, possibly because of an SLE. And finally, also, Take a look at the cast cells. The presence of RBC, the presence of cast cells, the presence of epithelial cells may actually suggest that the disease may be actually in the venal and not in the tubes. It may actually suggest that this may be an SLE or a leukosmetitis. On the other hand, the absence of cast cells may suggest that the disease is lower down in the tract, either in the ureter or in the bladder, the presence of nitrates may suggest an infection, but if the nitrates are negative, do not treat or do not abuse antibiotics. Now, preeclampsia, ladies and gentlemen, we have moved away from the traditional definition of preeclampsia being high blood pressure after 20 weeks significant protein. The new definition of preeclampsia, ladies and gentlemen, is not new. It's been around for a good almost a decade. Is proteinuria. It's, sorry, it's high blood pressure with one organ involvement. That organ need not often always be the kidney, need not often always be proteinuria. So preeclampsia, you don't really need proteinuria. High blood pressure with one organ involvement is the definition based on ISHAP guidelines 2012 for preeclampsia. Now, having said that, ladies and gentlemen, the most overrated diagnosis the most commonly abused medication is antibiotics in pregnancy. It is often what we see in our clinical practice that one may think that proteinuria is actually related to infection. The answer is no. Do not often always treat the infection first and then reassess no. Every proteinuria you need to reassess holistically. 
proteinuria alone is not a sensitive sign to diagnose UTI. The patient is symptomatic, is good to treat, but if the patient is asymptomatic, do not treat based on the leukocytes, do not treat based on the proteinuria, or look at the nitrates, but treat based on the gold standard, which is urine culture. The most sensitive indicator in pregnancy for urine tract infection are the nitrates, but the gold standard is the urine culture. So do not abuse antibiotics. Do not assume that all proteinuria is because of infection. Take a look at the urine full examination and microscopic examination, but treat based on symptoms or treat based on culture. Fact number two, some simple rules about proteinuria, ladies and gentlemen. It is benign and physiological. If your urine PCR is less than 0 0.3 grams, it could be because of three things. Orthostatic, it could be transient, it could be dietary related. So you can be assured that it is physiological. If it's less than 0 0.3, you may follow up the patient with some simple lifestyle modifications. It is not urine tract infection if the nitrates are negative. But if you think it is urine tract infection, if the patient is symptomatic treat, the patient is asymptomatic, then do a urine culture and treat based on the culture and sensitivity. When should you refer? The moment you have a proteinuria, be it one plus, be it two plus or three plus or four plus, and a urine PCR. If it's above 0 0.3 grams, early pregnancy, look for a cause, Late pregnancy, think of preeclampsia, but this patient needs to be referred for a holistic approach and assessment for a cost of a proteinuria. So this is my approach to proteinuria, ladies and gentlemen. If the patient is proteinuric at booking, early in the pregnancy, I would look for a renal cox. Is it an asymptomatic infection? Is it a hepatitis B-related nephropathy? So it's important to ensure that the infective screening, especially hepatitis B and C, is normal. This patient may need an ultrasound assessment of the tract. She may have stones. She may have obstructive uropathy. She may have shrunken kidneys. So an ultrasound KUB is important. The second cause in Malaysia after an infection is diabetes. So screen for diabetes. The patient may have hypertension causing renal diseases and nephropathy but the patient may have renal diseases causing hypertension. So please check the blood pressure. Also think at other causes. This may be a lupus nephritis, which is not uncommon in this part of the world. So do an a and &E. The patient may have an underlying glomerular nephritis, possibly the most common diagnosis. One important intervention is to do a biopsy. Ladies and gentlemen, pregnancy is not a contraindication for a renal biopsy. It's important to confirm the diagnosis and sometimes you may prognosticate the patient. And sometimes if it comes back as IgA nephropathy, the patient may also benefit from steroids, hence renal biopsy is one among the many investigations for patients with proteinuria at pregnancy. Pregnancy, especially before 25 weeks, it's not a contraindication for renal biopsy. On the other hand, if the proteinuria occurs later, especially if she's got a negative urine PCR early in the pregnancy, think of preeclampsia, which is the most common diagnosis, but exclude infection, exclude a flare of SLE. It's important to do a simple blood test called ANE to exclude a flare of SLE for the very first time in pregnancy. Now, what are the other tests that you can do? a and &E, to exclude connective tissue diseases. ANCA, anti-neutrophil cytoplastic antibodies to look into other small vessel vasculitis. Your complements C3, C4, although the levels may change and may drop during pregnancy, looking into serial levels or correlating C3, C4 with a and &E, may be important. You can also do rheumatoid factor, cryoglobulins, C3 nephrotic factors. And these are other investigations that one may do, apart from what I've mentioned earlier. How about biopsy, ladies and gentlemen? I'd like to highlight one fact. The evidence is clear. 
pregnancy alone is not a contraindication for a renal biopsy before 25 weeks. Sometimes you may need a biopsy to prognosticate, to diagnose, and to guide treatment. So renal biopsy, especially earlier in the pregnancy at booking or before 25 weeks, is part of a holistic investigation. Hence, it's important to get the right experts to see an experienced nephrologist. Biopsy should not be denied just because a mother is pregnant. Now, how do you differentiate between nephritic and nephrotic syndrome, ladies and gentlemen? Nephritic means your 24 hours urine protein. This is the instance when you actually need the gold standard rather than the urine PCR. It's got a protein load of less than 3.5 grams. The patient may be oliguric. The patient may present with acute renal failure, but it may have a slow progressive pace. Take a look at the cast cells looking and excluding into SLE. Take a look at the RBC and the YBC. The creatinine may be elevated, may not be elevated. How about nephrotic, ladies and gentlemen? It's another spectrum of significant proteinuria. This time, the protein loss is significant beyond 3.5 grams. The patient may have significant proteinuria, may have hypertension, hypoalbuminemia, and maybe edematous. And sure, there's no ascites, there's no acute pulmonary edema. The urine analysis may be bland. The presentation may be normal. Think of preeclampsia. It's important to exclude other causes. If the patient is nephritic, these are my five algorithms. Look for urine sediments. Set an anti-GBM marker to look at anti-GBM disease. Send an ANCA to look into vaginous disease. Send a C3, C4, and an a &E. If the C3 is low, think of SLE. Think of infective endocarditis. Think of post-infectious GN. But this patient actually will also benefit from a biopsy. How about nephrotic syndrome? Measure the blood pressure. It may be high. Check the urine culture. It may be because of an infection, but rarely does an infection cause such a significant proteinuria. Take a look at the renal function. The creatinine may be normal, may be elevated, but take a look at the liver function, looking at the serum albumin, because if it's low, the patient has got a risk of trophosis. If the albumin is low, take a look at the sodium level. Do an ultrasound, lure out an obstructive cause. Diabetes and OGTT, although rarely maybe you have an New onset diabetes with nephrotic syndrome. C3, C4, double standard DNA to exclude SLE. ANCA to exclude vasculitis. But among all these investigations, apart from taking a good history, which is highly of value, a renal biopsy should be also part of the algorithm to look for an underlying cause. It is not actually contraindicated in practice. So ladies and gentlemen, to summarize my entire talk, I've got two more important slides. This is my systematic approach for any pregnant mother who presents with proteinuria at booking or early in the pregnancy. For all the high-risk mothers that I see, a mother who's diabetic, a mother who's hypertensive, a mother who's known to have a renal disease, or who has a family history of renal disease, mothers who are beyond the age of 40 or mothers who are known to have single kidney disease. I do not do a urine albumin at booking. I do a urine PCR at booking that may tell me whether they do have a proteinuria or whether they are not proteinuric because a urine albumin is insensitive, especially if the degree of loss is below 30 milligrams. If they are proteinuric, the level of significance is 0.3. So I believe for high-risk mothers, use urine PCR. For all mothers, remember one fact, your urine albumin is highly insensitive. If the proteinuria is significant, I'll look for a cause. I'll take a look at the urine, take a look at the calf cells, take a look at the RBCs. RBCs and calf cells may suggest SLE, Take a look at the nitrates. 
an ultrasound KUB, it's important to rule out an obstructive uropathy. And also, sometimes to give you a clue about what a diabetes is, is get your nephrologist involved, actually subject her to a biopsy, which is not contraindicated. She may have possibly an underlying GN on an undiagnosed GN. Send an ANA to exclude SLE. Look for other common causes in these parts of the world, apart from infection and stones, could be diabetes and hypertension. Do not forget your urine culture. Do not forget some common infective causes such as HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C. I think this patient needs a maternal medicine review and assessment. and need to have a combined care with the nephrologist. Having established the diagnosis, it should not just the fetus that needs to be monitoring, but the mother needs to be monitored via renal function, liver function, taking a look at a serum albumin, for progression of disease, renal complications, and also maybe thromboprophylaxis if the albumin is low. She may also need aspirin, 150 milligrams, calcium and claxane, a low molecular weight heparin if the albumin is below 20. Take a look at fetal growth blood pressure measurements. She needs, apart from a maternal medicine, follow-up and care, a referral to the nephrologist as well. The aim is to deliver her at 37 weeks, purely because it is impossible, it's almost difficult to differentiate between nursing proteinuria with preeclampsia. But if you do need to exclude one important biomarker, is the split PLGF ratio may be beneficial if it's not significant, if it's not above 38, then you can confidently exclude that this is not pre -eclipsia. So an s PLGF ratio should not be routinely used, but you can use it as a marker to exclude pre -eclipsia. And these patients, if the renal function is normal, can benefit and will benefit from an ACE inhibitor post-delivery, it is not contraindicated in breastfeeding. You can start in the immediate postpartum state, especially if the mother is known to be proteinuric remote from term. And with regards to interpregnancy, apart from contraception, this patient actually needs a long-term nephrology review, follow-up, and plan of care on when and to embark in the next pregnancy and what other investigations and medications she needs. But ACE inhibitors should ideally be started for these patients. How about an approach to proteinuria, not at booking, but at term? If she presents with proteinuria at term, ladies and gentlemen, confirm significance. Even for one plus, you should confirm significance. Use a value of 0 0.3. If it's significant, think of preeclampsia until proven otherwise. Do not lateralize your thought too much. Most likely, it is preeclampsia. But it's important to think of other, at least a few common uh, differential diagnoses. Refer, even if the blood pressure is normal, because proteinuria may be the first manifestation of preeclampsia, although the patient may have various other manifestations. Preeclampsia, the management should be inpatient because it may be rapid, it may be progressive, it does not follow stepwise slow progressive pattern. It is important to manage all patients with proteinuria as inpatient. Do a urine analysis. Take a look at the car cells, the RBC, the nitrates. This patient needs a renal function. So any patient who's proteinuric, a renal function should be the minimum blood test to be done. The liver function and a full blood count. Once again, hepatitis B, urine culture, ANE. Pregnancy does not affect ANA, you can do ANA. Inpatient management, maternal medicine input, especially if the patient is severely preterm. Plan the delivery anytime between 34 to 37 weeks, but you need a holistic approach, taking a look at the severity of the preeclampsia and how it progresses. And you need to follow up these patients until complete resolution. If there's no resolution, then the patient needs a nephrology referral and an input. Ladies and gentlemen, does the amount of proteinuria correlate with the severity of preeclampsia? The answer is no. Once 
you have confirmed your diagnosis, once you have got your PCR of above 0 0.3, there's no value to repeat and repeat and repeat because all you need is to exclude a level which is physiological. And more severe proteinuria does not mean she's got a worsening disease. So one test that you should not repeat or quantify repeatedly, especially if the patient has got preeclampsia, is a urine PCR. You only need to do it once to confirm the diagnosis. Once confirmed, no value in repeating. You don't actually need 24 hours urine. In my center, we have moved away from 24 hours urine PCR in the last 26 years. We only do PCR in most instances. The serum albumin drops below 20. She should need thromboprophylaxis. But take a look at the sodium levels. The sodium level drops below 130. That may perhaps be an indication for delivery. But think of acute pulmonary edema and DVT. Management of preeclampsia, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to highlight too much. It should be inpatient. It should be in a tertiary hospital. Optimal BP control, low blood pressure, mild blood pressure needs no intervention. Moderate to high blood pressure needs intervention. The aim should be between 140 to 150. So the isolate of below 90. You also need fetal growth and Doppler. You need a full blood count to take a look at the platelets. Renal function to take a look at the creatinine, although it may be insensitive. Liver function to take a look at the serum albumin, which may give you an indicator of the severity of proteinuria, but we should not do uric acid and make a clinical decision based on the uric acid. It is insensitive. If you're having challenges differentiating whether this is preeclampsia or this is underlying renal disease, we can use an s plgf ratio has a sign to exclude preeclampsia, but not to guide timing or management, but to exclude preeclampsia. Consider delivery between 34 to 37 weeks, depending on the severity of preeclampsia. Nasplit PLGF ratio of above 38 is highly suspicious of preeclampsia. You confirm the diagnosis. If it's below 38, you've got a 99% negative predictive value and perhaps this patient does not have preeclampsia but instead an other cause but having said that what is the most correct ratio for patients with renal disease you are still postulating but people believe that the ratios are affected among patients with renal diseases so to summarize my talk ladies and gentlemen not all proteinuria is uti not all proteinuria is preeclampsia. As obstetricians, we need to discuss and differentiate two different diseases. Is it an underlying renal disease which is worsening, or is it a new disease called preeclampsia which was never there? Hence, the assessment at booking is extremely crucial. I believe urine albumin is insensitive to detect proteinuria. Although we should universally screen all pregnant mothers, relying purely on urine albumin alone is insensitive. For high risk mothers, move away from urine albumin, use a urine PCR, which is far more sensitive. Apart from that, to screen for renal diseases, apart from urine PCR, you also need a renal function, a simple renal function for almost all pregnant mothers and add a liver function. I think selected group of patients will benefit from 24 hours urine protein. If the urine dipstick for any occasion happens to be more than one plus, do not assume it is normal. You need to quantify it to ensure it is below 0 0.3 grams. If it's proteinuria before 20 weeks, you need a systematic approach like what I highlighted earlier to look at other causes. This patient needs aspirin to prevent preeclampsia, flexane to prevent thrombosis, especially if the albumin drops below 20. Ultrasound KUB, exclude diabetes, monitor the blood pressure, ANA to exclude lupus, infective causes of hepatitis B, and a biopsy, which is an important part of the assessment. Proteinuria, on the other hand, later, nearer towards term, you may think it is preeclampsia, 
timely delivery is important, but it's important to exclude other causes. Take a good history. Monitor for progression, serial scans, preeclampsia, prophylaxis. Any patient with proteinuria, especially with significant, you need a specialist referral and a holistic review because it is not as common or as benign as what we think. But if you are unsure, pick the phone, speak to a mental medicine specialist. It is okay to ask, but it's not okay to miss a diagnosis, especially if it's because of a significant cause. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end with this slide. One in five women in the reproductive age group have an undiagnosed renal disease. I think almost every pregnant mother needs a renal function, but a urine albumin is highly insensitive. GFR is recommended outside pregnancy. It is not been validated during pregnancy. If you follow a creatinine alone, a rise in creatinine is a late sign. There's already 50% damage to the renal function. All high-risk patients send a urine PCR and a renal function. I think that should be the minimum standards, not a urine albumin. The proteinuria is significant at booking or early. Refer to an expert, a maternal medicine expert, or a nephrologist. You need a systematic approach. But let us remember the renal biopsy is an important part of an assessment. Proteinuria at term, then you may think preeclampsia. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, these are some important articles that's good to read. It's a good paper by the ACOG guidelines talking about proteinuria during pregnancy. It talks about pathophysiology and clinical significance. To know more about preeclampsia, I would recommend you the ESHEP guidelines talking about preeclampsia, the classification, diagnosis, and management. With that, I'd like to thank you so much for your attention. If you need more information, kindly visit www.obstetricmedicine.my. Thank you so much for your attention.